Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. What I wanted to talk about today is something I've been thinking about recently, and I think I think it is sufficiently accessible, at least at some level, to be interesting to a broad cross-section of people. So, so hopefully uh, you'll get something out of it, even if you're not an expert in, in turbulence. So since this is a colloquium, I quickly downloaded some images from um, Google just to sort of set the scene. And these really are perhaps from the front page of Google. Uh, this is a this is a, a very popular picture that helps me detect if the projector's working, because it's got nice red. This is an aircraft coming into land, and these are the trailing vortices breaking up, and there's small scales. So this is a you know, typical engineering picture. This is uh, something where you can clearly see this in, in, in the domestic setting, you know, a nice laminar flow of fluid hitting the base, and I'm not quite sure what they've got here, cup overflowing and producing complicated motions. This is flow out of a pipe. This is uh, isocontours of vorticity amplitude in three-dimensional decaying turbulence. This is flow past a sphere, I think. And this, I like this picture because this is, this is a generic scientist. I, I put his name down there, but pointing to the nonlinearity in the Navier-Stokes equations, which is the cause of all the trouble. And I guess what I'm trying to show in this overhead is that turbulence is, is, is um, a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, but I guess the, the, the best way to describe it is, is, a flow, is, a, is a property of the flow such that there are lots of time scales and length scales. And we basically don't really understand it. And that's, that's a very good, easy definition of, of turbulence. <laughs> now, I'm not going to consider these complicated flows. I'm going to consider something very manageable. This is one of these canonical flows. I've, I've, I've stolen this from John Gibson, who's done a lot of work on this flow. So it's one of the simplest things that you can generate. It's plain coet flow so that the top of this box is flowing in this direction as indicated by that arrow. The bottom of the box is, is flowing in that direction. So there's a simple shear. And in between these two upper and lower surfaces is a fluid. And what's shown here is the flow not being a nice, simple, unidirectional flow. In other words, sharing the same symmetries as the forcing. So if, if the flow was just the simple shear, which you get at very small values of this shearing, then the colors would just be uniform, but gradually going from blue to red up here. But as you can see, they vary in the spanwise direction, indicating that the flow, you know, the broken symmetries. This is time dependent. And this is the, you know, the start of the long journey towards the turbulent state where uh, this, is a, this is a nice cartoon that I, I've um, taken from one of Paul Manville papers. He describes it as featureless turbulence. So in other words, you know, a wide variety of length scales and time scales. And the flow is very complicated. So this particular flow here is probably about here. What's different, or what, what I should point out with this picture down here, this sort of uh, regime diagram, is that this is for plane coet flow extending, extended in all the directions. So very large plane coet flow. Whereas typically, when you do computational studies, you impose a certain periodicity in the streamwise direction here and in the spanwise direction. And in fact, I'm afraid to say I'm going to be looking at those sorts of flows in this talk. So I'm going to be talking about very sort of clean model systems where we can study what's going on turbulently. So now I'm going to go back to my title. So I, I sort of try to indicate what turbulence uh, could be, or a rough definition of it. And I want to spend the uh, first half of this talk talking about periodic orbits, the evidence so far for why they're interesting, why they're part of turbulence, uh, the current state of the art for finding them. And then um, I want to talk about a new method for finding them, which hopefully will replace the current state of the art to become the future state of the art. Uh, just to mention for some postdocs that have helped me with this work over the years, Gary Chandler. Uh, Dan Lucas, who's now a lecturer at Keel, and Jacob Page, who's still with me. So this, this is the overhead, really, that got me started thinking about periodic orbits nearly 20 years ago. A very famous paper now by uh, Kawahara and Kida, 
Uh, in Kyoto, I think they were at the time. Uh, so this is the plane quet flow situation here. So I've sketched it. And this is a small domain. So the normal way you talk about this flow is to take your length scale as twice, sorry, as, as uh, your length scale as um, being twice the separation between the plates. So that's why LZ is 2H. And then these are the, the periodicities imposed on the flow. I'm not quite sure why they, they chose these, but they did. And uh, because this is 2001, they were only using about 15,000 degrees of freedom and a Reynolds number of 400. So this is, you could imagine, but fairly weakly turbulent, but it is turbulent. Um, now this plot, I should explain it because it's, it's going to come up a lot. Here's the energy input. This is I, energy input. And D, that's energy output, otherwise known as the dissipation rate. So these are rates. And so on average, in a statistically steady state, the flow should be sort of centered around this line where they're equal. OK, so that's why you, you see this roughly centered on this line of equal input and output. What's plotted here is um, a long DNS signal. So you know, every time that you choose some time increment, you plot the input and the dissipation. The green dots are supposed to indicate equal time intervals, so you get an idea of how quickly the flow is transiting through a part of this plane. So for example, here the orbit is moving very quickly, whereas it's spending a lot of time down here where they're very densely packed. And of course, your eye is drawn to this red closed loop, and that is a periodic orbit that they extracted from the DNS. Um, and they extracted it from the yellow loop, which is actually part of the trajectory and is unclosed. OK? So really, the underlying question in this talk is, how do you detect those yellow loops to then find the red loop and then be able to say something about the turbulent flow? OK, now I'm going to touch on all of those issues during this talk. But the very interesting thing of this piece of work was not necessarily this diagram or this picture, but what they did with this periodic orbit. So then they took this periodic orbit and compared it with the statistics of the turbulence. So here the periodic orbit that they found had a period of 64.7, that little h over u, the velocity imposed on the boundaries of your plane quet flow system. And they compared it with the a, with a low order statistics over the DNS signal of 6 times 10 to the 4. So they did a, maybe they took the average over the whole of this trajectory and compared it with the periodic orbit just over its period. And of course, what, what, one of the first things that you want to look at when you're trying to predict um, turbulence is what the mean profile is. So this diagram isn't, isn't really great in terms of orientating it with this little cartoon here. So I, I've sort of rotated it and inverted it. And this is what the mean profile looks like compared to this cartoon here. If it was just the basic unidirectional 1D state, it would be a straight line shear between these two. So you get this characteristic S with the mean flow gradually losing its shear in the interior. And this is the prediction from the periodic orbit. The periodic orbit is the, is the solid line, and then the turbulence are the discrete symbols. And then this is the uh, RMS values of the fluctuations. And you can see the correspondence is, is not so great there, but it's still not bad. And this is all using one periodic orbit. So you know, did they get lucky? Is this some great new way of analyzing turbulence? You just find one periodic orbit, and then you're done. Well, uh, unfortunately not. But you know, this, is, this is the sort of piece of work that gets you interested and intrigued, and you want to work on it. So in fact, there are more periodic orbits. So this is uh, some follow-up work in 2007. Viswanath was involved in this, Gibson and Predrag Satanovich. They looked at plane quet flow. Same Reynolds number, up the degrees of freedom. So now we're doing 100,000. And this is some uh, funky representation that they used based on one of the equilibrium states they found in the flow and then the unstable directions of that state. That's not really important. It's just some motivated way to try and project the dynamics down. This is the plot not to focus on. This is the plot I want you to look at. 
there are five uh, unstable periodic orbits on here. And this dotted line is, is the DNS in this projection. So you can see all, there are lots of periodic orbits buried inside this turbulence. And then the question is, well, uh, which one is the right one? Which one is the Kawahara and Kida one that I want to then take the statistics of? Well, in fact, if you do that, you'll find that none of these really work that well. And so then you come to think, well, OK, maybe I need some weighted mean of them. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's an issue I'll come back to. But anyway, so here were five. And here's a different flow where uh, we found 50. And we were still counting. So let me just explain this flow a little bit. It's, it's 2D. You know, if, you're, if you're trying to really push something, you've got a 2D. Very famous flow where you force it at a large um, wavelength. And you can do the same thing. You can find, and this is now PDF of the energy input versus the dissipation. So darker colors are where the trajectory spends most of its time. Lighter colors where it uh, goes through sort of bursting episodes. And the, all these closed lines, these different colors represent periodic orbits. And I've, I think I've shown about 20 here. So you can see they really pile in uh, to cover where the turbulence spends most of its time. And of course, this suggests to you a sort of um, a dynamical systems perspective where you have a turbulent attractor and you've got periodic orbits which are densely packed inside. And so you can really hope that maybe finding these, finding enough of them, you might be able to make some progress understanding what, what's going on. I should also say what's happening over here. Because it's 2D, I've just drawn the component of the vorticity out of the flow domain. And red is positive and blue is negative. So you can see it goes through episodes where it sort of pseudo settles down like there. And then it goes through sort of bursting situations where it really shears and becomes very energetic. And that, of course, corresponds to being up here. But really, most of the time, it's down here. This turns out to be a very interesting flow, actually, because what, what it turns out to be is two structures which are frustrated in this domain. If you open up this domain, you get all sorts of interesting dynamics, because then they can coexist. But that's, that's by the by here. The point of this overhead is to show you now we have 50 in this situation, and to show you the sort of things that you can do. So this is a very good example where this is the flow. This is all slowed down now. This is the DNS. You can see there's a coherent structure in the center of the domain. And then it breaks down. But there's certainly coherence there. And this is what you can extract out of that DNS as a, a, a periodic orbit. And that's, that's a solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. It just happens to be unstable, but only in a very small way. Now, what do I mean by small? I mean, I mean that it only has a very small number of unstable directions. So let's say this computation had 100,000 degrees of freedom. There might only be 10 unstable directions. So there's you know, uh, 990, no, 99,990 stable directions. So you can imagine that the, the flow wants to come in, you know, be attracted to this state, and then it, ultimately it gets flung out. The other thing to take out from this comparison is that your eye is naturally drawn to the dynamics in the center of the domain. Whereas if you look at the corners, there's a very large, strong vortex just sitting there. That's not really replicated here. If you look at that picture again, the vortex is much weaker look, there. So really, you know, we were lucky to converge this based on what was happening here. Really, this is, you know, it's got the same sort of structure, but it's much weaker than, than the actual state here. And of course, it's, this essentially highlights the, the struggle or the challenge when you ex have a large domain and you're trying to extract coherency. You know, the coherency might only be in a certain part of your domain. And you know, if you try and converge the whole domain as a whole dynamical structure, you might miss it. Whereas, of course, you know, our eyes are very good at picking up that this is obviously related to that. And we were lucky here that we managed to get the whole, whole situation. But you know, in terms of is the trajectory in phase space getting close to this at this point here? Well, it is in the center, but what about at the sides? And how do you sort of develop a, a proper metric for that? OK, so what, let's say you've got one of these periodic orbits. 
Remember, this is a sort of motivation part of the talk where I say the periodic orbits are interesting. Well, at the very least, you, you can take one of these, and this is one of the longer period ones. So this is 37 in those units of h over u. And you can see what happens as you go around the periodic orbit, and you can sort of diagnose the dynamics. And I have to apologize. The color schemes changed slightly here. So positive vorticity is white, and uh, negative vorticity is red. It just so happens that this reproduces better in black and white. So journals like prefer this, or they did in the old days. And you can see that you know this is the nice quiet region here where these two structures just sort of sit next to each other, and then you go through this uh, shearing episode, and then you settle down and you come back again. And there's a very good example of exactly this approach being used very profitably in uh, shear flows. And it's essentially through this approach that the self-sustaining process was discovered. Um, this is the key paper, Hamilton, Kim, and Morleff. And I was looking at the citations recently. And this now has 503 citations, probably many more now. And these are the subsequent papers build, built on this. There's the Kawahara and Kida one. And this paper was one of the first to actually find these sorts of structures within turbulent flow experimentally. And of course, what's happening here is that this is a, a, a very generic mechanism now we now appreciate where so-called streaks interact with waves and vortices to produce solutions which can sustain themselves against viscosity. So I, won't really, I don't really want to spend time going into this, but this has been a very important uh, realization in shear flows over the last 20 years. And that came about by doing this sort of analysis where you try and see where the flow becomes nearly periodic. And they did it by shrinking the domain, looking for a minimal flow unit, recognizing these structures, and then ultimately um, converging exact solutions of the equations in terms of traveling waves. And then if you're really lucky and you've got enough of these periodic orbits, you can start thinking about making some predictions. So here, let's say gamma is a key quantity you're interested in, let's say, dissipation or um, shear on the surface, then you can take a weighted average of that property associated with a periodic orbit, where the weighting here is wi for the periodic orbit, which is labeled i. Of course, the, the big question is how to choose these w's. There is some theory for uh, low dimensional dynamical systems called periodic orbit theory goes back to uh, Predrag Satanovic in the uh, late 90s. And uh, you, know, you can try and do this. So we did this with the 50 UPOs we found in Komogorov flow. So this is the PDF of the energy. This is the PDF of the dissipation. So let's maybe just focus on this one. This is probably the most informative. With a periodic orbit theory, you can take your periodic orbits and you can produce this purple curve. You can see it's very lumpy, so that indicates that we haven't got enough orbits. But also what's interesting is just taking uh, equal weighting, so taking wi to be 1, just produces just as good a prediction, really, if not better than the DNS, which is the blue. And you can also see that the, the tail of the distribution is not being picked up at all because we haven't got enough statistics, we haven't got enough periodic orbits that reach that far. So this is the hope, but we're a long way away from realizing it. And of course, the central issue here is we don't have enough of them. So we need to improve. We need to improve our capability of finding these periodic orbits. So that's what the rest of the talk is about. So this is the current state of the art. It's very naive, uh, but it's been what's been used since uh, Kawahara and Kida 2001. And that is to do a very simple search. So you, you do your DNS for whatever flow you're interested in. So this is the velocity field you get out at a certain time, some point in space. And you compare it with the history of the flow. You choose some capital T to go back over time. So here I've chosen a history of 50. And I basically look for where the flow starts to look like it was 
sometime previously, normalized appropriately, and it's just an L2 norm. And you can see this is the simplest thing that you write down. There's nothing optimized about it. But it's, it's sort of worked up till now, but obviously it can be improved. So let me explain this plot here. So I've drawn a line at this point. I think it's like 158. So this is my simulation. I run it to about t equals 158. And then I look back through the history. So this is fixed at 158. And now I'm just going through history with capital T going back in time. And I look for a minimum. And you can see there's a minimum there, this blue. And it's not, it's not an eye-catching minimum, right? These, these values don't really change by very much. It's not as if I'm getting orders of magnitude improvement. But it is a minimum all the same. And then you can try and, try and converge this as an initial guess with a period appropriate to this gap. And all these black dots converged to give periodic orbits. So this one in particular converges. In. I won't go into, into the, how you converge them. It's basically a glorified newton raphson in multi-dimensions. But the point is that you identify them like this, and you can potentially converge them. Now, there's one very important fact from this diagram. That is, you require the flow to stay close to the periodic orbit for almost the whole of the period. Otherwise, you won't recognize that it's nearly come back to itself. OK, so here's my periodic orbit. I need my trajectory to come in, go around, and then whiz off again. And I need this to be sufficiently close such that I can recognize it's almost completed a loop. And that's a serious issue as the Reynolds number increases, as your domain increases. And that's really been a, a bit of a bottleneck for this approach. So that's why we started looking for different approaches. And it's the different approach that I think might be quite interesting to people interested in fluid mechanics or people not interested in fluid mechanics. But excuse me. Yeah. This, uh, this picture that you just showed, is, is it stable under all the parameters of your simulation? It will be, I mean, None of these orbits are stable. No, I mean, so you get this picture. Yeah. And now you change your, let's say, your step size or some kind of parameters that you have in there. Yeah. Do you get the same thing? Or well, well, okay. I want to ask, when you change a little bit the, the, the parameters of the flow, is this going to be, uh, is this going to be you know, differentiable picture with, with respect to some, some of the parameters? This picture? Yes. Um, well, look, so first of all, this is, this is a chaotic system, right? So if I, if I change my dynamical system slightly, and I start with the same initial condition, I've got no hope of finding this one precisely at this point sometime later. But what I do have a hope of is finding some of these other ones, but at different times. So it's sort of structurally robust, but not point-wise, as it were. I wouldn't expect that. OK. So OK, so this is a, just a brief summary of where we are. Problem finding, periodic orbits embedded in turbulent flows. Just introduce you to recurrent flow analysis, a very naive Dumb approach, really. Needs to flow to shadow a whole periodic orbit. Less likely as the Reynolds number goes to infinity. Can we recognize near recurrent behavior using a more sophisticated approach? Well, OK, so this is what I'm now going to talk about. In a, in a, well, there's two heavy overheads, and then I'll talk about it in a very light and breezy way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Koopman analysis. Now, phys physicists usually are very comfortable with Koopman analysis. They know it's very strong, but useless in the sense that um, it's very hard to find the modes. And it's a very nice idea, but uh, impractical. But anyway, I'll come on to that. Let's just first introduce what it is. So let's say I've got a nonlinear dynamical system, just written very simply here. F is nonlinear. You know, no restrictions on F except you know, smooth, differentiable. And this is my time stepper, little f. So the Koopman operator is a linear infinite dimensional operator. I'll come back to the infinite dimensional later. Suggested by Koopman in 1931, which acts on observables of, and let's, let's just cut to the chase. Let's say u is a, a velocity field. It doesn't have to be, but it's, it's my dependent variable. So basically, this, this uh, observable psi takes u, which is in A, and produces a number. And so the Koopman operator essentially 
moves this observable forward in time. Okay, so this looks like a really good way of stepping forward in time, something I'm interested in the flow. Let's say I'm interested in the dissipation. Well, the dissipation is an observable because it takes the U-field over the whole domain, calculates the dissipation and produces a number. So anyway, what's interesting about this is it's linear. Well, in a very trivial way that I try to outline here. And I'm very glad that we've got red on the overhead now. So this just takes two observables. When I, when I do the Koopman operator, it just distributes, and then I can reconstitute it here. So it's linear. So I can, I've now got all the linear analysis tricks that we're, we're all uh, told at uh, graduate school. So I can expect eigenfunctions, eigenvalues of this linear operator. And I can, in particular, look at eigenfunctions, which just time step in a very nice way. Okay, so if I just Koopman operate on this eigenfunction, it only evolves in an exponential way like this, just rescales. Lambda could be complex. Okay, so as soon as I've got eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, I can then say, well, okay, what, if I take any observable, can I just have an expansion like this of eigenfunctions? And then I can do all the usual linear things. I can say, well, okay, so if I want this dissipation time-stepped, then I, I, def I bring in the time operator on U. That changes the argument. But if I've got this expansion, I know how to deal with all these things because all it does is just bring these exponential terms down. So that really looks great because, you know, even though this kappa, this Koopman operator is linear, all the complication is in this, what's happening to the argument. Okay, this looks like magic. I'll tell you it's not magic in a minute. I'll show you why it's not magic. Now, what you can do is stack lots of these observables into a vector. And I think the easiest way of, of absorbing that sentence is to say, well, what happens if the observables are values of u at grid points? That's certainly an observable, right? So I can, I can say, at this point in my spatial domain, what is the velocity field? That is a scalar. Or it's a three vector if I want to take account of the three directions in three space. But, you know, I can write it as this. Okay, so this is U at those grid points. These are the Koopman eigenfunctions. This is now called the Koopman mode. So this is like the big vector which has the same form as this observable here. So these are just basically the coefficients which map the eigenfunction and eigenvalues over here. So this is the expansion you're looking at. OK, so let's just do a simple example before I actually do something a little bit more important. So here's a very simple system. u dot time derivative of u equals minus au. Solution, that. The Koopman eigenfunctions look like this. So they're just u to the power n. And I've, I've made an assumption here that I'm only interested in analytic functions phi, right? And I'll come down to that in a moment. And then lambda n is minus na here, where n is a positive number, including 0. And you can see what happens when I just apply the Koopman operator on here. u to the n, if I, and then I use that. And you can see this exponential coming down here. And then this is clearly the eigenfunction here, minus na. So, Important little observation here is the eigenfunctions can be nonlinear functions of u despite the linear equation. Okay. And these eigenfunctions really can span the space of real analytic functions because you, I don't think too many people would balk at seeing this expression here where these are the coefficients in front of the Koopman eigenfunctions. And of course, I can build this up into vectors like this if I've got more than one observable. These, these just tell me which, which of these eigenfunctions I need. Another example, pitchfork bifurcation. So this is a very simple example where you're going from a repeller at r equals 0 to an attractor at r equals 1, right? It's a very simple equation. Can I express this using this? approach as a function of time. Well, it's very easy to write down 
The solution to this equation is here. OK. And this is the, the, the dynamics again. And here are the two expansions. It turns out you need two expansions, one around the origin and one around the destination point. These are very familiar, easily calculated, but these are the Koopman eigenfunctions. These are the Koopman modes, and these are the Koopman eigenvalues exponentiated. So indeed, you have this representation. Now, what we're trying to do is saying, well, actually, can we use this to find points in the flow which are nearly recurrent? That's where we're heading. And just to give, just to give you a feel for why this is a, well, essentially why this operator is linear and it's infinite dimensional, let me go back to this system here and do something called Kalman linearization. So this is a one-dimensional nonlinear equation because of the R cubed. But I can turn it into an infinite set of linear equations just by defining new dependent variables. So here, for example, if I say, well, why don't I just make R cubed a new dependent variable, x2? If I do that, I need a new equation for x2. Here's the new equation. But what I do is I generate a new nonlinearity, which is r to the 5. I'll just make that x3. I need an equation for x3. And I can just keep doing this, but the system will never close. And what I'll find is an infinite linear system here in terms of my new variables. And it turns out that the eigenfunctions of this are the, eigen, are the Koopman eigenfunctions. And the, the eigenvalues of this are the Koopman eigenvalues. And the left eigenvectors define the eigenmodes, the Koopman modes. So this is where this infinite dimensionality has come from. This is how I can turn a nonlinear system into a linear system. But the payback is it's an infinite dimensional system. Now it's rather interesting that, that Kalman came up with this a year after Koopman. But you can't really see any connection in the literature, which is sort of fascinating. OK, so why now? Well, it turns out that uh, a, a numerical procedure invented recently, well, 2010 is recent, by Peter Schmidt and quickly developed by others, can take data and generate Koopman eigenvalues and eigenfunctions in certain limits. So let me just briefly discuss this. And the reason this is interesting is that you can do this on data, either numerical or experimental. You can say, well, OK, I'm going to develop a vector of observables at a certain time, which is a, a function of my velocity field. I'm going to measure it again at a certain time later and keep on measuring it and then build up this data set. And then I'm going to measure at precisely delta t later from each of these observation times. And then I'm going to take the best fit linear operator between these two. OK, so this is the best fit linear operator. And essentially, what I'm going to do then is look at the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of this operator k. And it turns out to be intimately linked to the Koopman operator in a, in a sort of a fairly deep way. Now, what's been interesting is that this has revolutionized how people are now starting to use Koopman analysis. They're basically doing DMD using the ideas and the, and the framework of Koopman analysis to then try and make deductions about dynamical systems. I'm interested in fluid flows, but this is very general. You can do it to any experiment, any data. So this is the point here. Connection to the Koopman operator, DMD gives you this sort of representation. So now the blue indicates the eigenfunction for the DMD. And the eigenvalue here, exponentiated. And the direct connection down here between the eigenfunction Koopman mode and eigenvalue. So this blue here corresponds to exactly that point there. An is this value here. And the, and the eigenvalues are the same. Right, so let me just briefly illustrate this for the uh, van der Poel oscillator. 
I will, I will come back to fluid mechanics in a moment. So this is a two-dimensional ODE. I can obviously write it like this, two first-order ODEs. Very famous picture in any mechanical engineering course. You have this limit cycle in red. This is X and X dot. And anything, any initial condition placed in the vicinity of this limit cycle, in fact, anywhere in the whole domain, will quickly converge in and then follow this limit cycle. Now, with DMD, you can basically do exactly what I said, take data along this loop. And I took 2,000 2, snapshots of what's happening, and then found the eigenvalues of that operator. And you find exactly the frequencies associated with the periodic orbit in red. And you also find the least decay rate of the, of the stable direction. It all comes out without doing any analysis. I don't have to find this exact orbit here and then do find the uh, linear subspace around it to find the eigenvalues. I can just do this DMD where I take data from um, a simulation in here, just a direct numerical solution of this, and I get the structure coming out. So this level here is negative, it's a decay, and it's the stable direction of the flow coming in. And here, by the way, is the vector of data I took. So I take x, x dot, x squared, x, x dot. This is the data I take along this trajectory as it comes in. This blue one here is the one I took. And you can do it with an unstable. So somebody, when I gave this talk somewhere else, said, oh, you've cheated because that's a stable, stable structure. So I said, OK, I'll add an unstable direction. So here's the unstable direction. Z dot equals sigma z, where sigma is a half, I think. And so it goes around the orbit, but then spirals out, wherever I start. And what happens then is I get the same eigenvalues out, but I also pick up the one unstable direction too. So that sigma is a half coming out nice and cleanly. All I'm doing is taking data along this DNS, process, processing it using DMD, and I'm picking up all the important things about the dynamics. We're doing minimal work, really. Back to Navier-Stokes. So the idea is I'm now going to do DMD on short windows of the turbulent DNS. Can I find near a current phenomena? Well, what's the idea here? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do data, just like I did on the van der Poel oscillator, of a DNS signal. I'm going to take the eigenvalues of the operator K, which is my best fit linear operator between all these snapshots. And then I'm going to plot them on this lambda r, lambda i diagram. And of course, if I find like this, that they're essentially equally spaced along the imaginary axis, so in other words, they're just oscillations, this starts to look like the flow is nearly periodic. This is an actual picture here, so this looks, that's precisely on zero. That's the first harmonic, that's the second harmonic, that's the third, it's not quite there, it's just off that line, guideline, and that one's clearly off being the fourth harmonic. But this is a pretty good example where the flow is looking like it's recurrent. Now, anything like this, this is indicates, oh, it's got an unstable direction. But I don't care about that. I just want the structure. And I can, based on these eigenvalues, you know, this is, this is omega 1, um, sorry, omega 0, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. I can make a best guess of what that fundamental frequency is. And then I can, I can develop some metric of how close it is to being recurrent. And you'll note here that when I do this, I take a fairly small value of n. n is 2 or 3. I'm not taking a lot. I'm just looking for dominant periodicity. OK? So you can see this is a very gen generic approach. And then once I've, once I've decided I've got a nearly periodic episode, let's say with uh, n equals 2 or 3 here, then I need to build a representation of what the velocity field is just using those modes. All right, so this is a very low dimensional representation of the flow. This is the corresponding Koopman mode for these, these values. And I use this as an initial guess for a periodic orbit within the turbulence. So this is just some uh, nitty gritty about how you choose the AJ. It's not particularly important, not particularly unique either, but but it seems to work quite well. 
And so this is what you find. So let's say I take a, a, a signal, and it's this blue line jaggling around. This is uh, time. This is the predicted uh, period of the periodicity. So let me just go back up here, or have I got it up there? Yes, I've got it here. So once I make a prediction about what the basic frequency is, I can then define a period just simply like that. I plot my data against this, this guess of what the period is. And underneath, I also plot this measure of how close I am to being periodic. OK, and yeah, that's, that's epsilon omega. Looks like omega epsilon, but anyway, it's, it's epsilon omega. And my threshold I just set as 5 times 10 to the minus 3, I think. Well, no, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 must be. And these green dots indicate where I think it's per nearly periodic behavior. All right, there's a lot more episodes here than uh, in the previous picture I showed you right at the beginning of the talk. And indeed, this new approach gives me these purple boxes as well as these orange boxes. So the previous state of the art, the recurrent flow analysis, only picked up these orangey boxes and managed to converge some periodic behavior in there. Whereas this new approach, we're able to pick up periodicity in here too. And the key difference is that this approach doesn't require us to collect data over the period of the periodic orbit. We don't need to shadow the orbit over its entirety. And I'll give you an ex explicit example of that. So here is um, a convergence on an energy input dissipation plot. So the turbulent trajectory is this red dotted line. It starts there. That's what that helpful S is supposed to indicate to me. It goes out here, around, around here, out over here, comes in, and I think finishes somewhere. I can't see the finish now. Oh, finishes down there. And what we managed to find using this DMD approach is that this, this flow looks periodic basically from here. All right, it doesn't look at just plotting on this graph. But anyway, we then take our low dimensional approximation of what the flow is doing, plug it into the Navier-Stokes equation. It, it carries through this blue line. Now, the reason it stops being solid here is because this is the data window. And then we continue it to reach the actual predicted period of the recurrent orbit. So the data window is 50, and our predicted UPO is 70. Now, what happens next is you put this guess into a glorified solver, and this blue line gradually converges through these green curves. All right, you can just about see the first iteration here to this purple curve, which is a periodic orbit. OK, and this, this is an example where we've taken data from a shorter data set, converged a periodic of a much longer period, well, much longer, at least uh, 40%. And we've used this now to find a lot more periodic orbits. So we're quite hopeful this is um, useful. So in terms of what I've tried to say, Koopman analysis is an in, in, interesting new perspective made practical recently by the discovery of the DMD algorithm. I think that's, that's a general message, whether you're interested in turbulence or not. Could this help you in your, your, your research? DMD can identify UPOs in turbulent DNS without the need for a near occurrence. So this is a major step forward from the, the current state of the art. And we're very hopeful this is going to help us find a lot more periodic orbits. And the other thing that we're very interested in doing is actually studying transient dynamics, transient slow dynamics, where you don't have uh, simple invariant sets. Everything's decaying down to zero. But can you still extract the slow, slow important dynamics? And this is very important in, in mixing events in stratified flows, for example, where you start with an initial condition, the flow mixes, and then just ebbs away to give you um, a zero velocity state. At the moment, there aren't many good techniques for actually trying to extract what's going on, because it's not 
a, a steady dynamical system. And here are just two, two little pictures here. This is a known UPO, and then this is one of the, the one I just showed you. This is the vorticity, streamwise vorticity, and you can just see. They're not particularly rigorous, vigorous, but you know, um, we're making progress in that. Okay, that's a good place for me to stop. So, in order to have this, uh, this, uh, this, this state, you need a steady state, right? So, any flow is statistically it, steady. Yes. So, you, you, so there is, there's, there must be some concept. I mean, if you have to, if you have these states, you, there must be some concept of the, uh, the. At least the uh, the the outside conditions or the the boundary conditions having some steady state. Do you think that any steady state flow has a periodic opt? Uh, or is there some kind of existence theorem of or or, or existence belief of uh, these periodic or orbits whenever you have a steady state? Or what are the conditions for having such a steady state? Uh, so it's having a well, periodic that's, or orbit. That's a very good question. Um, so I think I don't I don't think you you need to convince many people that as soon as you have a a complicated flow, say turbulent or even just chaotic, you've got periodic orbits. You know, anybody with any background in dynamical systems would be quite happy with that. Now, can I say for any in any fluid flow with steady initial conditions there will be periodics? No, I can't periodic orbits, no, I can't, because I know situations where you can have steady conditions and you have no turbulence. In fact, there's only one state which is a global attractor for all Reynolds numbers. But those are rare and I don't, you know, they're hard fought to try and prove that they are. So, that, so there's, there's going to be no existence, you know. If, if you have chaos, chaos or turbulence, then yes, but then that's the harder question, finding chaos and, and turbulence. How far can we go with a method like that? I mean, it seems that as you increase Reynolds number, it yeah. will become much, much, much more complicated and many more. Uh, so it seems like we were very limited in uh, how That's far right. we can go. That's right. And uh, I'm not so hopeful in my lifetime of being able to use this practically. But I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking, well, OK, so all this sort of sub-community looking at exact structures of the equations, you know, simple invariant solutions of the turbulent attractor. Um, where else can you go with this approach? Certainly you can, you can pick up simple solutions, solutions which you think are particularly relevant to your parameter regime. But ultimately, if you're going to try and validate the dynamical systems approach, one has to go down this route. Now, whether you can actually do it is another question. Now, I would say, I would say 50 years ago, I bet you nobody had, would have any idea that I would be standing here talking about this, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, go back to the literature and you read papers 50 years ago, you know, the world has really changed. Just look at computing. I mean, you know, the, the very fact that this work is now possible is only due to Computing. I mean, you know, I could do these computations on that laptop. It's, it's embarrassing, really. So I don't know. In 50 years' time, will we be doing this automatically? I don't know. Or will we just be doing DNS and nobody will care about this? Or will we, will we be all doing machine learning? I don't know. <laughs> well, so this, this is, uh, you know, something I, I didn't mention in my talk, but this is eminently convertible into machine learning. In fact, that's... That's one thing we're doing now. So we're machine learning down to an optimal basis and then looking for periodic orbits in that. That's very successful. Well, I'm not sure that you, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I haven't tried it yet, but maybe that's, that's yeah, maybe that's something. But, it's, you know, it's a philosophical question, right? You know, so, okay, so let's say we don't do this. What else are we going to do? Are we just going to say, we'll just do DNS or we're going to piece together sort of little cartoons of what's happening in the flow. You know, you could, we could do that. But, you know, there's a long-term picture here that um, you can see working. It's just a question of how hard it is. 
Yeah, I have a more basic question because I'm not a fluid dynamics guy. So first of all, how do you know that this uh, Kopman operator is going to be diagonalizable? Uh, how do I know so it's going to be in, in some basis? But uh, how do you know that this will work well? You know, I mean, like. Oh, you don't. Not for the, certainly for the Navier-Stokes equations. OK. OK, so. But, but this is the classic case. So you suck it and see. All right. You know, DNS is very cheap. And uh, most of the time, people are lo looking for what to do with their DNS. And so you just try it. Yeah. And then I have more questions. Um, so like, why would you expect there to be uh, periodic orbits, well, unstable, but with very few unstable directions? I mean. Right, so that's a discovery. OK. So, we did, so one of the things, you know, when um, Christoph was introducing me and he mentioned traveling waves and these structures in pipe flow, it was a surprise when we found that these structures, although unstable, have very small dimensional unstable manifold. It doesn't have to be that way. I don't, I, you know, I can't see any reason why it should be like that. Mm. And maybe if 50% were unstable and 50% were stable, we'd find a very different flow. But that's just what it is. It seems to be. So it might be as a function of Reynolds number, actually. It does go to 50%. Is it a general like, uh, feature of uh, dynamical systems, or is it specific no. to your kind of fluid dynamics situation? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It's just okay. what we've observed so far in, in a number of different canonical flows. And all these flows are typically linked by unidirectional driving. So that might be key. I don't know whether if you were to drive it in various different directions that would disrupt that. Mm. I don't know, but that's the observation so far, working basis. That's what we find. Very nice, thank you very much. But uh, actually, uh, there seems to be a remarkable uh, lack of communication with the rich literature along the same lines in, uh, you know, you, you are obviously, you have colleagues at Dant, and you yourself do GFD and, uh, and uh, astrophysical mm. fluid dynamics. We knew this stuff for 30 years, that typically, you know, there is a dissipation. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's a nonlinear Laplacian, which yes. has no negative uh, eigenvalues. And then there are just a few directions that are associated with instabilities. Yes. And there are specific calculations which are done for you know, full general circulation models with, you know, many, many, uh, maybe at the time when we first looked at these things, it was only a few 10 to the four or five. Now it's 10 to the six or seven or more variables. And uh, there are maybe 100 directions which are unstable, which arise yeah. from other instabilities than necessarily the Jacobian, you know, the thing that <coughs> you, yes. your Bhattacharya is pointing to. Uh, yeah. In, in the first slide. And uh, uh, well, of course, uh, Koopman and DMD has been very fashionable in non-GFD and GAFD uh, recently. You know, we've had various kinds of so-called empirical orthogonal functions and other basis functions yes. uh, in which we've been doing these things and looking yes. at weakly unstable periodic orbits Yes. in the context of predictability at very long times compared to the characteristic time of the eddies yes. that are the weather systems in the flow. So, you know, this is, this is really great, but frankly, there's a lot of other stuff. Oh, well, there's loads of stuff. Periodic orbits are everywhere. It's going on that, you know, unstable periodic orbits and, as I said, you know, just very weakly unstable ones. So. Yeah. So, you're, so the answer to you is, yeah, there, there, there's lots of other things where they're just the yeah unstable manifold and yeah stable manifold. I mean, you, you mentioned many things there. So for example, the dimension of the attractor, right? So that, that, that's obviously related to how unstable the structures are. Yeah, well, I mean, what I've tried to talk about here is actually a systematic way of finding the orbits and then trying to go further than just saying, OK, there's one orbit here that seems to be interesting. Maybe we can compare it with some observations we notice. Yeah. So exactly. that's the challenge. No, no, but you know, I mean, what people know typically about metrology is that you 
it's three dimensional, you know, learn some track them, right? Yeah. Okay. These things for, you know, much bigger systems. Yeah. And systematically. Yeah. Okay. Was that a question? I don't know whether you work this, know this work from Hake and his group in, in Essen. So what they did, they took a, a classical chaotic system like a billiard, and then uh, well, they looked for the periodic uh, orbits, and then, um, well, the periodic orbits, when they come closer, you can, the idea is you can switch between the orbits. Yes. Uh, and putting these orbits together, you can reconstruct the whole yes. spectrum of eigenvalues. So this somehow you, you um, I mean, using the Goodfiller trace formula. Yeah. So somehow you try to do the, the same thing for turbulence, which I find the very that's, nice that's, idea. That's periodic orbit theory. And, and, a, and a crucial thing with periodic orbit theory is you have some sort of symbolic dynamics. So you can label the periodic orbits, order them, and then you can build an expansion based on where they are in that alphabet. We don't have anything like that for turbulence. That's the, that's the problem of trying to go from a very low dimensional approach where you can, as I say, build periodic symbols and then order them. And then, in fact, you know of a certain length that you've got all of them. At the moment, we're at the stage of just finding random ones and then hoping we've got enough of them as a function of the period and then build any expansion. But the trouble is we don't have any symbol symbolic dynamics of, of the flow. So we're at this stage now of finding lots of them, and, but we don't really know how they're ordered, which ones are really important, which ones are not. So you can do, you can do a, f a few ad hoc things based on periodic orbit theory. You can, you can build the weights on how unstable they are in terms of you know, functions of all their unstable eigenvalues or functions of the, un the number of unstable directions. But these are all guesses at this stage because we just don't have a, uh, a derivation of how to do it. Uh, if you add a stochastic forcing to the system, yes, is there something analogous you can do? I mean, you don't have periodic orbits there. Is there something you can do there? Uh, if you add, well, um, what would you do? <laughs> I haven't really thought about that so much. I mean, I guess, it would increase my dissipation, right? And um, then I'd have to start thinking about periodic orbits in some sort of statistical way. Uh, maybe I could do the same thing, but after I've done that statistical averaging, I don't know, I haven't really thought about it. So I just wanted to, to, to understand. So your periodic orbit is an exact solution. What, what you think? It, you think it is an exact solution of the Lambier-Stokes equations yes. of uh, under quet flow conditions, yes. for example. Yes. Now you change uh, the conditions of your quet flow or yes. of your system. Yeah. Um, I asked the question before, but maybe I wasn't clear. Do you? There should be some kind of response function, right? I mean, there should be. The, the, the orbit is not going to go away no. immediately. So no. it's a stable object in the sense that now you, you know, it has response functions. Yeah. So you can work on that. You can you can you use can work on it. You yeah. can make all of that. Can you, you can yeah. then once you have some of them, I mean, they must be stable. I mean, they just, they cannot go away. In some sense, right? it would yes. be really amazing. Robust. If they, they must be robust, yes. that's what I'm saying. Yes. So that could be some, so I'm just asking, so are, you, are people working on the statistical mechanics? I mean, once you have response function, then you have statistical mechanics. Yeah, well, I mean, it relies on the fact that you've got enough of them, so let's say one Reynolds number. So, you know, you basically use your DNS at one Reynolds number to find all these periodic orbits, and then you use those periodic orbits to make a prediction at a different Reynolds number. Yes, that's, that's the hope. But we already know there's an issue with that. And the, and the issue is that some of the, you know, if you, if you track these periodic orbits, some of them go through bifurcations. So they might not reach that point. They might bend back in parameter space. But then you'd hope that you have enough of them that when you average through your expansion, that gets washed away. But yeah, those are all, those are all the ideas that you're after. Yeah. More questions? I might have one additional question, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
so you showed a 2D Kolmogorov yeah. simulation. So in, in this case, we expect, so you will have inverse cascade and condensate with large scale mode, which I would expect will uh, show low dimensional behavior more easily than the small scale. So is it true to expect this type of method to be more efficient for 2D turbulent flows and freely? In the uh, sense that we have large scale mode with possibly low dimensional behavior. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, are you, you appealing to the fact that the dynamics aren't so, so violent? Possibly. Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to how unstable each of these individual structures are. So maybe you could argue that, you know, if there's stable, uh, quite a few stable large wavelengths, then they'd be more stable. But that, that's the but key thing. There is thing. no clear. Uh, uh, I don't think I, I just don't think we know it. We don't know enough about it. I mean, you know, it's okay. just um, there's not enough developed theory. We're okay. still sort of poking around, trying to learn. Okay. okay more questions? Good. So thank you again. Okay. Very much. Thank you.